All right, so um, everyone, um, now for our second speaker, we have Casper. Casper is a developer advocate at Quadrant, and he has been working with Quadrant for uh, quite a bit now, and he has done a lot of cool work in terms of tutorials, um, uh, live workshops, uh, showing people how to get started with vector databases, showing people how to create embedding models. He has also done some work in the integration of Quadrant with uh, Langchain, if I'm not mistaken, Casper. And he has just been a true advocate in the space of uh, vector databases. So um, I'm very excited to introduce Casper. He's going to be um, walking us through what are um, embedding models and different ways in which you can think about these models. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it away to Casper. And again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get through them once Casper finishes um, his presentation. So Casper, thank you very much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ramon. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. And yeah, basically I was, uh, I'm still one of the top contributors to Langchain, <laughs> to my surprise, uh, like in top 20, but, but also to some other libraries, this is also pretty, rapidly changing environment there's lots of different different libraries out there if i could add something to the to the rust discussion we are also extremely happy about choosing rust as a as a language to implement uh, quadrant because uh, that already gives us a, really a performance boost also the the uh, memory safety guarantees something that we really appreciate and actually that's actually that's probably right now the best choice for any kind of databases if you would like to implement any. Also, uh, today I'll be speaking about uh, the embedding models. And since I worked for Quadrants for around two years now, I have experienced a lot of different implementations of retrieval augmented generation apps, uh, but also semantic search in general, things like uh, reverse image search, or just pure extension to an existing keyword-based uh, based search systems. So I feel like there are some misconceptions about embedding models and also about some different components that are used in those pipelines. So I, I would like to clarify a bit uh, some, some things that I think are generally uh, not that well understood. Uh, before I start, let me just introduce myself and the company I work for. So my name is Kasper Rukowski and I work uh, for Quadrant, as I already mentioned. And Quadrant is a company that builds an open source uh, open source vector database. One thing that I forgot to do, uh, I just need to share my screens so we can see, uh, see the slides, maybe. It might be pretty, uh, pretty cool to have. And I hope you can already see them. Yes, yeah, so uh, basically, uh, my talk will be uh, will be about the constructing the text embedding models I already mentioned, and Quadrant is one of the one of the open source vector databases, aka vector search engines. Actually, we prefer the latter term because uh, it's not a real database with some. Uh, guarantees that you would uh, usually expect from, from a database. Quadrant is uh, based on HNSW, which is state-of-the-art in terms of approximate nearest neighbors, because that's in a nutshell what we do uh, when we think about vector databases. This is just some sort of approximation over pure k-nearest neighbors. Uh, so basically, we are also within Rust. Uh, we have multiple interfaces integrate with lots of frameworks and libraries that you can know already, uh, with lots of uh, official SDKs. And on top of vector search, we also provide you with additional filtering constraints that you can apply on the, on the results. I will mention that later on. And our mission is to make vector search affordable so you can put more vectors into the same low-end machine and still expect decent results. But OK, uh, my today's talk won't be that much about Quadrant itself, but something that you have to use if you decide to start using vector databases. Uh, right now, multimodality is a hot topic, so we not only rely on text embedding models, um, but use some other ones to convert images or videos or 
actually any kind of data that you could think uh, think about. As long as you are able to find the proper network, you can actually do it. Uh, Quadrant is embedding agnostic, so actually it's up to you how you create the uh, neural embeddings out of your data. Uh, but general principles are pretty the same, uh, no matter what is the modality that you use. What you expect from a semantic search is to uh, convert your input data into fixed dimensional representations, so those vector representations are close to each other if they represent similar input objects. As uh, as you may see on, 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 on the picture, striped blue shirt made from cotton should be pretty close to cotton-made maritime shirt. That would be actually my expectation if I would be looking for a new shirt in any e-commerce uh, store. And as an end user, you may perceive the embedding model as some sort of black box that takes some input and produces the numerical uh, vector representation, keeping the semantics of the input data. But there's more to it. Um, the embedding models do not work end to end. I mean, they do not work on texts directly, uh, but converts the texts uh, into an intermediate representation using numbers. This process, uh, this process is called tokenization. And um, actually the whole process of neural networks uh, doing creating those embeddings might be simplified to just a few steps. So first of all, we uh, divide into our original texts into uh, tokens, and this is done by the tokenizer. That's something that I would really love to focus uh, on today. And tokenization, tokenization is actually a separate process that requires separate training and inference. It's also heavily dependent on the training data. And sometimes people just take one of the existing tokenizers that was already pre-trained uh, on a different corpus and use it to create their embedding models. I, I just want to prove that that might be not the best, uh, not the best idea to do it if you would like to create your own embedding models. Uh, and coming back to the process, once we have the tokens, uh, the tokens are converted into token embeddings, which are assigned by the by the uh, embedding model itself. So there is a tokenizer that converts text into set of numbers, a sequence of numbers. And then those numbers are just converted one by one by the uh, by the model into some sort of embeddings. Um, and then uh, we have a model that does some sort of transformation. This is a pure neural network. And at the very end, uh, we uh, expect to have a single em embedding representation, single vector for a whole text. And we have some sort of pooling mechanism. Usually this is uh, based on mean uh, or average polling. So we simply take the average of all the embeddings created during that process. And there is already a certain limitation. Each model may accept only a certain number of input tokens. So uh, if we want to put more information into, uh, into the model, it would be great to have as little tokens per word as possible. And when I when I speak about tokens, we could probably review how the in, all, in general texts are built. So uh, at the very uh, low level, uh, we have letters that then uh, form uh, words. Those words build sentences, and finally you have whole texts uh, describing a particular idea, concept, event, whatever we really want to describe. And tokens are somewhere in between letters and towards. Um, there are different strategies here. I would be focusing on uh, on the one which is called word piece, which used to be quite popular. Right now we have some 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 different different ways, but basically the idea is is the same. We just want to have a mechanism that will be dividing uh dividing the text into subunits that make some sense because they hopefully describe uh, a, a specific concept. And if you didn't work that much with embeddings yet, you might be uh, wondering what are the options here. In 
majority of, of, of my uh, tutorials, I try to use the open source models and there is plenty of them available and some of them are really state of the art in terms of, of uh, um, semantic search. There are some leaderboards so you can easily choose uh, some, of the, some of the existing ones and open source are not that bad. So sentence transformers are pretty well known, but flag embeddings as well. And if you prefer some some uh, APIs, then you have Hugging Face Inference API, or OpenAI Cohere, or Aleph Alpha, and plenty of our embedding providers. Uh, maybe you work in a, in a specific domain. I would expect that there might be already an embedding provider giving you a model that works specifically for for the industry you focus on. But in all my examples today, I'm going to use the pretty old all mini LM L6 V2 uh, sentence transformer, uh, which is obviously not the latest embedding model available out there. But the general idea is pretty similar in all the models and all the tokenizers. So it is just to showcase how the general process looks like and how we can possibly uh, derive some, some, some uh, intuition about what will be the performance of this specific model in a non-benchmark scenario using my own data so I can already know that maybe this specific model is not the best choice. Mm. The output of, of this sentence transformer it has uh, around 400 dimensions, which is relatively low comparing to, for example, OpenAI embeddings, which are probably the most popular ones because they are the defaults of Langchain, Lama Index, and many of other tools. And I would really love to focus on the on the tokenizer itself because I feel this is really an underrated, undervalued uh, piece that we usually take for granted. Uh, and there is so much complexity inside. I mean, there are so many things that may go wrong with the tokenizer itself, and they have direct impact on the on the model, uh, on the embedding model. So we definitely need to uh, treat it with with some more respect, definitely more than we when we do right now. And uh, tokenizer is a part of the process that is quite commonly forgotten. Uh, it does a pretty simple job of splitting text into pieces, which might be pretty obvious. I mean, the way of how to do it might be pretty obvious in terms of some popular languages like English. But if you work with less popular ones, uh, you might be struggling just because the tokenizer is just poor. Uh, so it has a direct impact of the, of the final embedding center quality. Uh, the model that I selected, the, the sentence transform I, I'll be uh, working with, take, takes up to uh, 256 tokens at a time, and it's based on work pieces, the tokenizer itself. If you watch the brilliant video from Andre Karpati, that, that got pretty pretty popular recently. Uh, he was describing how to create uh, your own tokenizer uh, that was based on the bait bar encodings. And the algorithm is, is uh, slightly different. This bait bar tokenizer is quite commonly used in LLMs, uh, but sentence transformers are also quite, quite often based on the word piece. So if you get the idea of, of how it may work, I, I believe that might be easily transferred to, to LLMs. Because the impact and the, the uh, issues that, that tokenizers may generate are common for both embedding models and, and large language models as well. So the tokenizer is, is also trained on some textual data, uh, textual corpus. Uh, and uh, this is a usually a deterministic process. So uh, we have a bunch of text that we just uh, sent through the uh, through the uh, tokenizer training algorithm, and it should always return the same uh, the same configuration at the very end. Uh, contrary to to the model itself, which which has a training phase based on the stochastic gradient descent, and this is random in nature. Uh, tokenizer simply performs some some statistical analysis. So so it all starts with uh, a vocabulary that is initialized with all the individual characters from the language, and actually not from the whole language, but rather from the training corpus that we provide. 
uh, probably all the all the Latin letters will be already already covered. But if you work with some other languages or if you deal with data coming from the internet, there might be also some additional characters. So uh, so this is all based on the on the training data. Would be best to have a broad coverage of all the all the characters that we expect to have. Mm. So uh, it is actually different to byte per encoding because uh, WordPiece usually takes all the characters that were available and uh, byte per encoding takes all the available bytes. So actually it always has uh, like 256 bytes uh, that are available uh, and that has some 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 smaller impact on, on the overall process. But, but the approach is different. And WordPiece does not uh, choose the most frequent. Uh, well, one thing that I forgot to mention basically, because we, it all starts with the all the individual characters, which are then iteratively grouped together. So if two characters are quite commonly put next to each other, uh, they may create another token, because uh, we want to find the some subsequences of the input data. Uh, that maximizes the likelihood, uh, the specific likelihood that uh, once added to the vocabulary. So, so this process is in an iterative way of finding those those words which are the the most common ones for for the uh, for the training data, and it is pretty fast overall. So, so it's quite easy to to train that tokenizers even on a load and low end machine. Uh, in a relative, uh, relatively uh, simple way. So, um, the training process just chooses those most common parts of the text and constitute a token uh, whenever it thinks that this particular text is, is worth doing so. There is one additional parameter to that, which is a predefined uh, vocabulary size. So it won't be able to produce more tokens than the expected number of tokens. Uh, and that's basically it. So that's the only limit. So, so, so the process is rather straightforward. Mm. So there are also some special tokens in, in that process because it's uh, also dependent on, the how, on how we uh, train the, uh, the embedding model and it requires some special tokens to exist in order to, to work. Uh, in terms of, uh, in, in case of, of the sentence transformer that I selected, uh, there is an unknown token uh, that actually is like a fallback for all the tokens that, that we couldn't find in the training data. There is a separated, separator token that marks the end of the sequence. Uh, we have a padding token, uh, the classification token, uh, which is used during the, uh, which is specific to BERT training. And the, it always starts each sequence. So every text starts with classification token and ends with uh, sep token, uh, which is the end of sequence. And there is also mask token, which is used during the training phase uh, that is not used uh, when we do the inference, when we create the embeddings. Uh, however, if you just put this sequence of characters into the input model, it will be treated as if it was like a real world because it just uses some sort of unicode characters under the hood so so you can try to to play with the with the embeddings by putting those special tokens and that may lead to some surprising results uh, nevertheless um, this is actually uh it when it comes to the special tokens so this is not like a long list of of some additional words that we add to the vocabulary and in general, uh, we can classify our tokens into uh, these four groups. So we have those special tokens that I mentioned. Uh, we have some whole words. And we also have some word pieces, what I uh, like to call subwords. We have some numbers, some special characters, and also some unused token, not tokens, which are just reserved for the future. Uh, this is also pretty important to know that. Uh, in the sentence transformer that I've uh, chosen, there is around a thousand tokens uh, which are unused by default. So we can extend the existing vocabulary and do some fine tuning of the model. I will describe the whole strategy of how to do that properly later on. 
Uh, and in addition to the tokenizer, uh, there is also a pre-tokenizer that split text by spaces and punctuation, which is also a parameter of the tokenizer itself. We can define a different uh, pre-tokenizer if we deal with different kind of data. Maybe your data is not like a real natural language, but more coming from, from uh, places in which people tend not to use punctuation at all, and you may have some different rules uh, to be chosen. And uh, there is also an optional normalizer that pre-process the text, uh, for example, to remove accents or to convert to lower case. Mm. In general, tokenizers are skewed towards the training data, surely, meaning that they prefer uh, common words they've seen during the training process. So we can expect that those, ho those whole word tokens will be created for the most popular words in the training data and the less popular ones will be just uh, chunked into several tokens and create those uh, word pieces or subwords. Mm, and that's that's a reality. So you cannot expect that the quality of the embeddings uh, will be the same if one of the tokens is generated, uh, for, uh, if, uh, if one of the embeddings is generated from a single token that describes this specific concept and the other one is just uh, just divided into a few separate tokens, which quite often occur in different contexts as well. Uh, basically, that impacts a lot the quality of the embeddings. Um, and we will be talking about measuring that quality in a really straightforward way in a few, in a few minutes. Um, what I realized after working with several Quadrants users is that there are some common uh, misconceptions uh, about the embedding models. Uh, so they are not that error-proof as, as some describe them, myself included actually, because I used to say a lot of things about many uh, properties of the embedding models that I trusted are tr were true, but apparently it turns out that this is just a side effect of the whole whole process of how embeddings work. And I would love to go through some of the misconceptions that I found to be really, uh, really common. But before we start, let me just clarify one thing. Uh, semantic search uh, requires to choose some sort of uh, some sort of similarity measure. Usually, it is a cosine similarity. I would say ninety percent of the cases that I worked with. Uh, by the way, there was like an interesting hot paper published yesterday or today morning, depending on where you live, actually. But that was published uh, by Netflix, and they were claiming that cosine similarity might not be the best choice. I haven't read that one, but this this got really hot in all the social channels like Twitter or LinkedIn. So that might be also worth reading if you work with, with semantic search. Uh, but basically, cosine similarity has a pretty useful property of being normalized uh, to the range of negative one, positive one, with one positive one being the ideal match. So this is pretty useful because we can also derive some relative similarity. So we can also try to say that this particular items are twice more similar to each other than the other ones, because we have minimum and maximum. That's pretty useful, because if you work with Euclidean distance or dot product, there are no limits. And it's quite hard to perform any sort of thresholding, for example, if you want to exclude some results which are less, less relevant than expected. And one of the common misbeliefs is that uh, negated sentences would be really far away from each other in that vector space. Actually, it turns out not to be that accurate. Uh, I, I just put this example, I like to eat apples, is closer to I don't like to eat apples than to I like to eat pears. Just because the semantic uh, does, is not impacted by, negate, uh, by negation. So even though some, some people could have expected that the, uh, the similarity of, of these two sentences would be really low, in reality, it's 0.9 something. So, so relatively high value. If also, 
uh, the sentence, I like to eat Granny Smiths, which is just a, some, some kind of apples, uh, also known as green apple or sour apple, this is this has the lowest similarity to the first example from all. So so uh, so it's not that easy. Like uh, that also depends on the training data, but it's not that easy to capture the overall overall meaning, especially if our documents are that short. Uh, so it's worth checking how how the embedding model behaves on some specific examples you have and have this just to have this intuition. But apparently it's not true, and some people just claim that that should be the case. Also, it, it's quite commonly said, being said that um, that typos are well captured by the embedding models, and then can easily uh, find out that a, a, ty a typo in a in a specific word uh, does not impact the overall meaning. Apparently, it's not true. As you may see, uh, we have two examples, accommodate and accommodate with without double C, and it's just converted into completely different set of tokens. And that also impacts the quality of the embeddings. On the left-hand side, uh, we have a single token. This uh, classification and separator tokens are just everywhere, so they always start and end. Uh, and the uh, the sequence, but if you just look at the at the tokens in between, there is a single token on the left hand side and four tokens to represent just a typo in that word on the right hand side. In the middle, there is a cosine similarity between the embeddings generated by uh, those two uh, those two uh, words. So basically, this is really low. The same goes for uh, for another typos that we may have. They are just split into several short uh, sub word like embeddings, um, and that really impacts the the overall uh, semantic. Of course, um, if we have created the embeddings of two sentences, including both, like let's say we have a, a one sentence with one of those words like because, and then we just uh, change this particular word to the uh, to the uh, version with a typo. Mm, the overall um, similarity of those two sentences would be still relatively high because all the other words would match. It won't be ideal, like the match won't be like uh, one for cosine similar similarity, but I would still expect to be closer to one than to, to uh, 0.9. Uh, so definitely, it's I'm, all the embeddings are just are just designed to uh, to handle longer text than just single single uh, single uh, words. But still, typos are not when, uh, well handled by the embedding models, and uh, probably some sort of normalization would help with imp imp increasing the uh, the accuracy of the of the semantic search that you built. So it's still required. We used to remove some stop words in the past. We stopped doing that for the embedding models. Still, it seems like uh, it might be relevant still, but also changing the fixing the typos and some other uh, mistakes might be also a good idea to improve the quality even further. And there's Another misconception that I face quite often, which is all about handling numbers in the input data. As you may see, I just put some, uh, put a really simple example. This shirt costs $55. Um, I just used a different way of, of keeping this numerical value. And my expectation would be that the similarity is pretty high. Uh, the similarity between those two examples is pretty high. And apparently it is, like 0 0.80, 82, 83 is still relatively high. Uh, that really depends on the, on the model, of course, but that seems to be okay. I mean, like, it's not ideal, but that's fine. However, if we just change the numbers a little bit, and this chart costs 55 and 50, but using the same uh, the same way to encode the price, the similarity is even bigger. So 
Our model is not really able to capture the numbers inside. It has some uh, some idea that there were some numbers and probably uh, the token that is used for 55 and 50 is just pretty close to each other uh, in, in the embedding space of the input vectors. So that's that's the overall result of, of this kind of processing. And it gets even worse if we add an additional nine at the very end of that sentence. Here, the price is completely different and the similarity score uh, gets even closer to one, just because the uh, on the right-hand side, as you may see, uh, 559 was split into two tokens. So there is 55 and a uh, word piece token with just nine. Obviously, we have the same sequence of tokens with just an additional one at the very end in the second example. And that gives us already a boost of the similarity, even though from the human perspective, that those two sentences should be further away from each other. And the same goes for the dates. Uh, we could get higher similarity by uh, just swapping some of the numbers in the second example, like changing the month with the uh, with the day. So we would have like uh, 2024, 1602, and still the similarity would be higher than uh, to the same date, but just written differently. Mm, so this is a common misconception, and I've seen so many people trying to build retrieval augmented generation, and they were just trying to include some date-based or number-based constraints on the vector search directly into the into the prompts or into the queries that they were sending to, to the retrieval augmented generation. And this is not captured, captured that well because tokenization does not capture the numbers as whole units. So as a result, your semantic search is going to struggle with with uh, with capturing that, and you cannot expect relationships like cheaper than or before a specific uh, point in time to work that well uh, in this setup. And another another issue that uh, is quite common is that uh, there was like a cutoff at a specific point uh, point in time, and some of the words that became uh, really like the most popular ones uh, were not even included in the training data that was used for this particular model. Uh, OpenAI and uh, is converted into two tokens, Open and AI. There is still this discussion if OpenAI should rename themselves to Closed AI just because it's no longer that open. Um, also, when it comes to chat GPT, uh, it is divided even to, to three separate tokens, chat, which has something in, in, like in common. This is like a chat interface, but GPT is not captured that well. Right now, if you train the model on, on the current data, it could be even a single token created for both names because they, just, uh, they are just so popular. And if your data contains lots of proper names, uh, like company names that change so rapidly, uh, dense vector search, semantic search might be just not enough. And you need to enrich the semantic search with a retrieval component with something like uh, keyword-based search based on BM25 or some other kind of sparse vectors because they capture the exact, uh, exact match way, way better. Um, and if you do that, you need to build another component that will merge those results. So you would have a dense retrieval for the semantic search that we obviously want to have for retrieval augmented generation, then keyword-based search, and then you need to build a hybrid search that will be just taking results from both methods and then just re-ranking them using like approach that just works, works in a specific, specific, specific scenario learning to rank cross encoders or some other re-ranking models are usually the, the preferred way of doing that just to combine the result uh, results from both methods and rank them properly based on their uh, relevance but if you deal with 
some additional uh, some additional constraints that you want to apply on the vector search, like some dates uh, or price based constraints or some other attributes like tags that describe a particular uh, describe a particular item uh, that you want to encode through your uh, embedding models. You need to consider a different approach and actually there are some metadata filtering capabilities built in, in all the vector DBs that exist, I guess. Uh, in case of Quadrant, this is called payload indexes. Mm, and whenever you have an example of, uh, of a, a property that won't be captured by the embedding model or by its token either, even, uh, you should probably store this metadata as uh, next to the to the vector representations in your uh, quadrants collection, and use those those attributes to apply those criteria next to the vector search phase. Uh, this is pretty unique feature of quadrant. We have it built in to the vector search phase, so actually there is no need to do some pre pre or post filtering on all the items, all the uh, points that you have in a collection but you can apply that directly in the tra graph traversal phase. I'm not gonna get uh, much into detail, but basically that makes, this, uh, makes it uh, really efficient. And you can apply any kind of criteria that you can probably imagine in case of, of uh, numerical date, like properties, even geo coordinates, or also some full text filtering if you uh, wanna have that. And uh, another another thing is uh, not that common when you work with English data only, but if you work with some other languages like Polish in my example, because I'm from Poland, uh, in Polish you may have different forms of the of the same word, and this different form just shows a function of that word in the same sentence. So this is done by some sort of inflection, and here are just four forms. Of my uh, of my first name, as you may see, it is just divided into chunks, which seems to be okay. This is still a proper name, so so I would not expect to have a single word and a single word token created out of it. But the tokens are slightly different in all the cases, and there is not like a root form that this word is converted into. Actually, the idea behind uh, WordPress tokenizer was to capture the root form of the word and then the inflected uh, suffix uh, to be like a separate separate token in that sequence. But I was trying to figure it out and put some really simple examples to the tokenizer of, of the model I selected. And I tried uh, putting walk, walking, walked, for example. And all these three forms of the same word are just converted into different tokens. Uh, so, so there might be some issues with capturing that, even though the idea was to convert those different forms, like walk would be a single token, walking would be walk plus plus uh, this word piece token in, so just to like separate the root form from the uh, from the suffix, and walked would be also converted into two separate tokens. It doesn't happen. Maybe it happens for some specific cases. Uh, but the algorithm itself is probably just too uh, too basic to handle that properly. So some sort of linguistic knowledge, bringing that into the tokenizer might be also beneficial if you really do that. Actually, there is not a standard way of doing tokenization. Uh, your starting point might be just doing that in a different way by bringing this knowledge, uh, domain knowledge into the tokenizer and maybe doing that in a smarter way so that tokens really make sense. And coming back to that example, if I just calculate the similarity of, of my name, of different forms of my first name, you may see that it differs a lot, actually. Uh, in the worst case, it's uh, even below uh, 0.7, even though this is still me, this is still my name, and I would expect the similarity to be way bigger uh, whenever in my name uh, just appears in a different text with different form, it's still speaking about the same person. And this the same problem, actually, a similar problem occurs if we deal with non-natural language. If you do code search and if you select to use one of the 
transformers, one of the tokenizers that was trained on natural language like data, you shouldn't accept to, to have tokens which are specific to code. Uh, we were talking about Rust before, but uh, but Python has this has this idea of using white characters to define uh, different levels of, 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 of processing. So if you have a loop, you need to use uh, spaces or tabs uh, to, to define that this particular code is inside a loop or a side of it. Um, actually, for the tokenization, for the word piece tokenization, which is specific for, for this center transformers, for this center transformer, spaces are just ignored and they are not the part of the tokenization, even though for Python that, that, that would, would make a lot of sense to capture not only that a space exists, but also a number of spaces that exist in this particular location. So if you work with code, uh, you either need to consider some normalization if you just want to find some semantically similar pieces of, 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 of code based on the variable names, whatever, normalization should, should handle that. But if you really want to find a piece of code that does this particular thing, which is similar to the piece of code that I have, some near duplicates, for example, then you need a specialized code embeddings. Uh, again, just to sum it up, uh, a lot of issues related to embeddings trace back to the, to the canonization process. Um, if we represent a particular word as multiple tokens, the network, the embedding model, has to learn those relationships inside its parameters even though it could be captured by the embed by the token embedding itself. Um, also, those subwords occur in multiple different contexts in the input data, so they do not have an exact meaning, and even the positional encoding that exists in the in the bert like tokenizers won't help that much. So it is pretty important component to anyone who implements uh, review augmented uh, generation based applications or semantic search in general. I'm sorry. So um, if we divide text into chunks, uh, we also need, need to make sure that the number of chunks won't exceed the context length of the embedding model. So it's best to have a single token per word, because we can fit as many words as, as the size of the context length window. But if every single word is cut into pieces and split to multiple tokens, then uh, the context window just shortens. Mm. There are also some other issues with the, with the tokenizers, like uh, some of the tokenizers just ignore the fact that people use emojis, that already captures a lot of sentiment and overall meaning of the text as well. Um, there are also some, some Unicode characters which are not captured properly, uh, different styles of text like italic or bold. This is actually like if you use a text uh, text editor, it's not uh, the, the characters that you marked with italic are not converted into different characters, but in Unicode there are some subsets uh, so we can actually write a text and make it look as if it was italic, even though the, the, the platform does not allow to do that. Like if you want to have italic text on, on Twitter, you can do it. But those characters will be ignored by vast majority of the, of the tokenizers because they were just not trained on this specific kind of data. So maybe if you really want to deal with all the possible, all the possible Unicode characters, byte encoding might be a best choice for that. Still, it will also struggle for the same reason. It will be just cutting a single character, even uh, even into even a single character into multiple tokens. That would also uh, cause you some troubles at the very end. Uh, also, the number of tokens impacts the cost of using some APIs. If you use OpenAI embeddings, you pay for tokens, and if the tokens are not clear for you. Uh, you may be paying like twice as much because the number of tokens in your input data doubles just because the text is split into multiple tokens. So that's an issue uh, that would be great to solve somehow.
Okay, so so tokens are important and the tokenizer is, is vastly ignored. However, there are some pretty straightforward, straightforward metrics that we can derive directly from the tokenizer. And I want to cover them uh, briefly, because I believe the tokenizer itself can already give you an idea and help you estimate how well a specific embedding model is going to work in a non-benchmark scenario, in a non-benchmark setup with your own data. So the general framework is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, we uh, are just uh, trying to, to uh, measure the number of tokens and derive some metrics out of that. So we have some input tags and use tokenizers to, to create tokens out of them. And there is also an intermediate term, which is word. So our text is split into words. Uh, which is done by the pre-tokenizer, and then those individual words are just split into tokens. So we can actually do several several metrics. We can calculate several metrics here, and the first and the easiest one is to check the token frequency. Um, this uh, this training algorithm of of the tokenizers is iterative. I mean. It takes the all the characters from the input data and then iteratively combine them together to build some uh, some words that are of uh, that occur often often in the input data we provided. So the lower the index of a specific token in that vocabulary, the more common the word was in the overall core prora, and that already gives us some sort of distribution-like measure for all the text that were used in our training data. We can do basically the same thing. If we know the algorithm that was used to, uh, to create the tokenizer, we can do the same, the same training process and then compare the token frequency between, um, between those two sets, even though we do not have access to the training set anymore. Uh, because the lower the index of the particular word, the more frequently the word was used during the training. Mm -hmm. And this is some sort of estimate. If there is like a drift in terms of, of, of uh, those word frequencies, it's not that easy to be done. I mean, uh, we do not have like real frequencies for, for, for them. But if you see that some of your words uh, are really far away in the original vocabulary, but in the top results of the of the tokenizer that you trained on your own data, that already gives you this intuition that it may not be working that well because there were just little examples, just a few examples of that particular word in the original training data. So it may be just capturing that with some random representation. And another one, another metric that we may derive is a token length, a median token length for a whole text. So what is the, uh, for, for the, for a single word. So what is the number of tokens that we need to encode a specific word? And an ideal scenario would be to represent each word by just one token. That never happens, um, but this metric might be also used while you are already in production because you can easily see that if the uh, number of tokens per word increases uh, uh, comparing to the some past uh, some past measurements that may already uh, give you that that uh, that insight that there might be some sort of token drift maybe people started using different terms. So it's great to, to log this kind of information even in a, in a continuous process in an interactive manner while you are already uh, using a specific model. But also it's great to do that for, for, uh, for your data from the very beginning because that already gives you an intuition that maybe this particular model is described as working in my specific language, but in reality it is not that great comparing to uh, to the to the precision for English and all the benchmarks that I checked are for English data so so maybe my expectations are just too high and I should be like uh, using a different one and another one which is which is specific to to word piece uh, there is this special unknown token that might be also used 
to uh, check how many of the input words that I sent to the uh, to the tokenizer are uh, are converted into this unknown token, um, and how many of them are created per a single text. So this is also pretty easy measure, but already gives us this intuition that there is a vocabulary mismatch between the tokenizer I use and my data. And maybe I just need to consider doing uh, some 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 tweaking uh, of the tokenizer, or maybe just rebuilding my embedding model or switching to a different one, because it is not dealing well with with the data that I have. And tokenizer plays uh, tokenizer play a crucial role in the fine tuning of the embedding model itself. Still, uh, fine tuning is hard. Uh, if you want to do it, uh, you can probably just uh, try with some simpler means. And when it comes to the uh, to the embedding models and fine tuning them, the simplest thing that you can do is to uh, use one of those unused tokens and add some new uh, tokens based on your data that you have uh, so so the tokenizer itself can convert those words into into uh, some new embeddings so as i as i uh, as i probably mentioned already uh, in bird there is around uh, a thousand of unused tokens available that you can use for your own purposes so if you see that this particular word to use quite often in my data and the data that is coming to my system, you can probably add it to the tokenizer and create just a few training examples because obviously you also need to fine tune the embedding model. Uh, unused tokens have never occurred in the training process of, of the system. So they would have just a random embedding being created. I mean, the token embedding. So obviously you need to add some examples, but still you have some data using that specific new token that you just added. So it's pretty easy to be done. It's an unsupervised uh, process. So it's relatively easy. Still, there is this hard limit of the number of unused tokens that you have. Uh, alternatively, but I've never experienced anyone doing that, you could possibly try to change some of the existing tokens, then you probably need to provide a lot of more examples to like make the model forget the old meaning of that particular token ID. So, so that might be not the best idea. Still, if you have just a few uh, few mismatches between the vocabularies, that might be the simplest way. Because obviously, if you wanna readapt the existing embedding model to a completely new domain. Uh, that you also need to remember about the changing the tokenizer. And if you change the tokenizer and extend the vocabulary size, you still need to do the whole training process from scratch on a huge corpus, which might be an issue if you do not have resources to do that uh, or you have never trained an embedding model. It's not as easy as increasing the size of the vocabulary because those integers, the, the indexes of, of different tokens are converted into the embeddings as a very first step of the of the uh, of the embedding model processing. So you cannot expect to like change the number of the of the items in the vocabulary and you cannot expect the embedding model to work properly uh, in that scenario. So that usually requires doing the training from scratch, maybe some tricks like reusing the same weights, in the model, so it just learns uh, a bit faster. Still, um, still, the tokenizer plays crucial role. And if you feel like uh, you need fine tuning, maybe it will be just better to try out a different embedding model, because this is a, a tough process that not that many companies can can afford. Uh, also, due to some some uh, lack of knowledge of how to do that properly. And there is also an open challenge, and it also applies to LLMs. Maybe it would be better if you could get rid of the tokenization at all in both embedding models and LLMs, so they become end-to-end -end processing of text. That would be the best that may happen. This is still open question if we can really do that. And right now we need to use the tokenizers and we need to understand they are pretty important and there's probably no better way to do it. At least we do not know it yet. Um, so that's also why choosing an embedding provider should be a conscious decision, not like uh, choosing just 
anything random that exists and should be guided with some additional checks also on the tokenizer level. Great, if you have any questions, feel free to reach me out. Uh, I, I will just chat, check the chat in a second. Also, there are some links to my uh, social channels, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub. So feel free to drop me a message anytime. And this QR code points you to uh, Quadrant Cloud uh, Free Tire. So you can build your first semantic search application without worrying much about the infrastructure because Quadrant Cluster, and we one gigabyte Quadrant Cluster is available for you for free. And thanks a lot. Amazing. Thank you very much, Casper. Uh, what a fantastic talk. I think um, the tokenizers are, I kind of like, with all the abstract abstractions that we have today, especially in amazing libraries like Transformers, Langchain, um, and so on, I feel like they're sort of taken for granted uh, that they're there, but they're crucial into making your solution work correctly. Um, so it was a very good explanation of what they are, how they're used, and the differences um, of the context that they capture between one way of tokenizing versus another. Um, I guess, uh, if first off, if anybody has any questions, please unmute yourself and ask away. Or if you would rather put the question in the chat, that's also, um, that's also totally fine. We'll read it out loud. Um, I think for me, um, I do have a question for you, Casper, and that is like uh, we we focus a lot on uh, text for obvious reasons, but nowadays there's um, uh, there's also embeddings for uh, uh, multi modality uh, when we're dealing with text and other things, and you touched on it a little bit. So I guess I'm curious, uh, like, are there any do's and don'ts or things to watch out when we are using? or thinking about our embeddings models uh, for uh, multi-modality um, uh, use cases? Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, it's also pretty important to understand how those embeddings are created. And also there are some misconceptions, like Clip is probably the most popular embedding model for uh, multi-modality in terms of text and image. Uh, we played with, with that a bit, and we also faced an issue that texts were still closer to each other and images were closer to each other. Of course, if you have text uh, describing a particular image, the similarity would be high, but still text would be preferred over, uh, if you search with text and images would be preferred if you search for image. So, well, describing an image with just a few words is not that easy. There is usually some complexity, there is some background and those descriptions that, that uh, were used to train to train the uh, clip embeddings at least were just pretty generic describing like the main object on the particular image that there is more to that. So I feel like that was vastly ignored. Um, so if you wanna provide an interface that would allow you to um, search over a database, which is multimodal in nature, like text and images mixed up, uh, then your text queries uh, would uh, tend to attract text responses and the other way around. So uh, that might be pretty tricky to uh, to like make it working properly if you really want to do this multimodal search. I have no answer here. Actually, maybe there is a different model that that solves that uh, in a better way. But that's really an open open question. And if anyone knows the answer, I would appreciate to have that because we can probably rebuild our uh, one of our demos so we could wo work a bit better for that case. No, uh, nice and, and, and very well said. Like there, there's still something that um, I think a lot of people are trying to figure out at the moment. So I also second that, that if you find out a great answer for it, I also want to know. Um, Casper, uh, I, I got I have one more question, and you know, like again, if anyone has any questions, please just unmute yourself and ask away. Um, and that is, there's also uh, so I ask about multimodality, but then there's also tokenizers for completely different modalities. Um, is that something that uh, you think we have a greater understanding of, or the industry is still trying to like? find the best way to think through them. So for example, we uh, split images into 
um, specific pieces and we call them tokens. So we convert audio into images and then split it into different tokens. So yeah, is there, uh, are there, can you share your thoughts on those kinds of tokenizers for different modalities? Is that something that, um, but yeah, instead of me prompting you, like, can you share your thoughts about it and what you think we're at, where you think we are at uh, for tokenizers for different kinds of data? Uh, well, I would say um, I don't work that much with with different modalities. Like I wrote my master thesis on on speech recognition, but no one was using embeddings back then. I'm pretty old, it turns out. Uh, but yeah, apparently it seems like we are pretty early in in at least in that space. I would say maybe there are some other ways of how we could treat the tokenization and. Uh, if we do that properly, maybe we can get rid of those huge models and maybe simplify them a lot because they would not require that many, that many layers, that many parameters, and we could probably solve some some problems with simpler means just because of of doing the tokenization right. Unfortunately, I'm not sure how to how what to answer about different modalities. Probably it's even worse than the text embedding because the the industry is right now dominated by bringing text data. Into into search into semantic search, so I guess it may be even worse for the other modalities the modalities out there. No, yeah, and and, and I agree. Um, there's uh, I think there's still a lot of work to be on cover. So I, I'm I'm actually excited to see what happens in the future um, at the combination of uh, also multi modality and also different modalities. Uh, is there any? Uh, do you have any recommendations on? Um, like you mentioned a little bit about OpenAI uh, and their embedding models. Um, and then also you touched on like the, the good thing about open source and picking a good one. Do you have any recommendations on uh, like good defaults for experimentation? Yeah, so basically I would probably avoid relying on, on some services probably go for some open source models. Like uh, it's quite quite often a, a complaint that I read on, on, on LinkedIn or Twitter that people just complain that open AI services are not that reliable and they have lots of outages. Um, basically, I would probably go for some open source model first, like flag embeddings uh, are pretty good. Uh, also support multiple languages at the same time. Also, I love what Cohere does in terms of openness as well. This is a company which is somehow similar to OpenAI, but they also, uh, they have published like command R model uh, like yesterday, which became really, really hot. Uh, so I would say maybe Cohere might be one of the options, uh, but anything that is open source and does the job uh, properly should be, should be the default one. There are some leaderboards like MT uh, EB uh, leaderboard that might be used to to guide you to select the best model. So I would say the simplest and uh, the simplest model that does does the job in a particular scenario. You can. That's also quite quite often forgotten that we already know how to measure the the uh, quality of the retrieval. Like we have lots of metrics how to do that. Uh, people just take the take the uh, take that for granted and start using the defaults and expect that to work. We can if you have some data and if you can build like some sort of ground truth for that data, like what is the expected output for at least a couple of of the entries that you have, then you have you can have like a controlled environment and see uh, what uh, whether this particular model solves the problem. Uh, in your specific case, because obviously leaderboards and, and benchmarks might be a bit biased because everyone wants to win there. I agree. We should definitely take uh, benchmarks with a grain of salt. And uh, I think that the best ones out there put that in bold at the top. You know, this is like, this is a benchmark with specific parameters. Take it as you may. Um, but um, Casper, so Patrick mentioned, would you mind making the slides available? I think you put a QR code at the very end. Um, so I can also, if you share them with me as well, I'll post them underneath the, I'll post a link underneath the YouTube video. So um, within um, today, tomorrow, I'm going to split the videos and I'm going to put them on YouTube. 
I'll blast a message on the Meetup uh, channel so that everybody has access to the recordings of both sessions. And Casper, yeah, if you mind um, sharing the slides with me, I'll put a link to them in the in the video when I share it. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I will share them immediately after after our session, so we can have them already in place. I usually share them uh, later on on Share Deck or a different platform that I use. But I will just send you a PDF version if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, all right. Well, Casper, thank you so much for your time. I think this was extremely insightful and very useful to like uh, get a sense of how tokenizers works behind work behind the scenes and. Um, what should we watch out for when we pick one embedding model versus the other? So I, I really want to thank you on behalf of everyone. And um, yes, this was an excellent conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Ramon. Thanks for the invitation. That was a pleasure.